welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue the theme of previous videos talking about finance and financial mechanisms, economy, that sort of thing. So in modern finance, there is a great deal of disproportionality, which uh, means if you think about something being in balance or being in equilibrium, a lot of the financial problems of today come because there is an imbalance, a disproportion of value, which is what we're going to talk about. But in order to understand this disproportion of value that we have today, first we have to look at uh, how things were conducted in past centuries. Uh, the past thousand years, um, since the, the, since before the last thousands. So the 20th century was pretty much the time period in which the disproportionality in finance and value was in place. Before that, the past thousands of years before that, as far as written records are concerned, from the 1500s at least, silver was the primary international trade standard. And the usual problems that came with that had to do with scales that were off balance on purpose, sort of like the idea of having a loaded die, or counterfeit currency, which generally came in silver plating on coinage, whereas the silver in the internal silver would have been something relatively proportionate to the natural weight of silver so that they could use an inferior metal and then pass it off. But either way, silver was the international trade standard of past centuries other than of course the past 20th century the taller is the same thing as a dollar which was a silver dollar you can still purchase quote unquote silver dollars today but that's where our word dollar comes from and also the word taller it's the same word basically now the international trade standard of silver is based out of its weight so something that is equally is equivalent to the weight of silver um, that's a, a, a mechanism with which we can judge the standard of value now on the other hand modern value of silver is disproportionate to the past value of silver so you could have an object that at the time was equivalent in value to the equivalent weight in silver and today that object that was in the past of equivalent value to the equivalent weight of silver is more valuable than silver is today that shows you the disproportionality as far as modern uh, value of silver goes and value of everything really so a, a leave is the french word for the silver uh, currency that was used and it would have been a pound so that's where you get the pound sterling and of course uh, interestingly enough the symbol the currency symbol for pound sterling is an L with a line through it same symbol used for the French currency before the uh, devaluation of French currency away from silver when you had the imposition of like the franc in uh, the world war period of France and then of course right now they're on the euro which just like the British pound sterling currency has no actual silver in it and just as our US dollar is not silver so in the past counterfeiting would have been done through um, silver plated in a currency which is in essence difficult and requires some expertise but the currency that we have today is much easier to counterfeit because it is in fact itself not uh, it doesn't retain any inherent value to it so in that type of context you could have say silver 
a silver dollar yeah. that's worth yeah. maybe a hundred bucks. And then you could have something called a Magnus Lodestone, mentioned in the book uh, from 1596 about the new attractive that had to do with compass and the Magnus Lodestone and its effect on the magnetism and all that nonsense. Well, it, according to it, the type that you would get from Cast India would fetch its own weight in silver, making it an equivalency there. Of course, the Magnus Lodestone today, if we even knew what it would be called or what it would be under, I, my theory is that it's mined under the title of under lithium, under the cover of lithium mining. Well, that would have a value that's much higher today, and that gives you an idea of how silver has been suppressed. Now, the Magnus Lodestone, along with other things, are in large quantity, but also in high demand and highly regulated and controlled, making them more valuable. On the other hand, silver is specifically depressed for two reasons. There's two things that damage the modern understanding of silver value versus the old past centuries from like the 1800s and before in the international standard of silver being used as a mechanism for international trade. Now the first of that is the false reporting of silver value. So if you go onto a website and you look up the value of silver, pretty much across the board, all the websites that report silver value, they all report with this minor discrepancy, the same value of silver, and they're getting their silver value from the London Metal Exchange. Now, the London Metal Exchange does not just set the value of silver internationally on an arbitrary basis, but also they loan out futures and securities in silver, hypothecating and stating that they have essentially more quantity of silver than they actually do have. Now obviously those individuals who are allowed through the regulation of the London Metal Exchange to even take out securities and investments and things like that silver, they know it's a lie. They know that there's no actual uh, quantity of silver that's being betted on and so they're never going to call it up. It's a system completely propped up on fraud but with the intent of actually keeping the value of silver down from where it should be in in the desire of controlling the international trade mechanism because silver has inter, uh, historically been an international standard of exchange. Of course, naturally, ir many irregularities will arise from this arbitrary market manipulation and the line about value, the idea of hypothecation, stating you have more than you have, um, using someone else's, else's assets to take out loans, you know, all of these different things that they do, all of that stuff will naturally, inherently form irregularities within the economy and with an exchange. Now, the most obvious of this is with opal. Raw opal is more expensive than cut opal, opal that's been worked. And that means that regular independent individuals cannot turn a profit by cutting opal and thus it basically uh, pushes out any incentive for opal jewelry work. The same can be found in most other stones. Um, you know, obviously it'd be difficult to work diamond ind uh, individually. You would need um, some pretty hefty investment to be able to do that. But disproportionately, diamond and gold and other things are more valuable today than they were in the past. That, of course, is an irregularity that comes from the way they manipulate market through fraud. Now, there's another element to this, which is important, which doesn't just have to do with the United States, but is something that's easily represented within the United States as it affects other global uh, economic operations. And that's the executive order signed by uh, then President Donald Trump in 2019, I believe, but either way, it was the 2016 to 2020 period. And this contract or this executive order specifically stated that all the only contracts 
in the so-called U.S. federal government that would be recognized would be defense related. All other contracts would be uh, ignored, essentially. They would be terminated. Now, this, of course, would cause a huge problem for this globalist international control that we have. And so what they did is they transferred all contracts, all government contracts, under the Department of Defense, thus making them all, quote-unquote, defense contracts. And that's sort of the little fraudulent switch that they did to protect their control structure. So it's sort of a word game where most of us would think, oh, a defense contract is something that relates to, say, armament, maybe the welfare and care of troops, clothing, uniforms, food, those types of things. They took that and said, OK, so we're going to prioritize defense contracts. So we're going to make all contracts uh, under the Department of Defense so that they can call them defense contracts. So this is similar to what happened in relation to the same executive order where uh, subset um, different offices and departments, state agencies, things like that, they all started promoting this essential worker scheme, which was not contained in any of the language inside of that executive order, but they cited that executive order to establish their essential workers under the time of COVID. And of course, also the fact that because there was a declaration that uh, firearms related businesses, gun ranges and gun stores were important, they closed all but one in every state. So obviously that is a uh, interpretation of what's being told clearly um, against the interest of what's being declared there. But there's a lot more to the implication of this shifting all contracts under the Department of Defense. Basically, it means that you now have all in one place these huge contracts, and it shows you just how this mechanism of financial control and propping up phony uh, government entities and essentially tyranny that nobody wants and continuing it in the name of defense. This can be found on a file, uh, which is of 515 pages, titled DOD Vendors Over 25,000. So the contract's over 25000 but this document itself does not stipulate how much the contract could be. It could be in the billions, millions. It doesn't stipulate that. It just, it's all the contracts over 25000 of which there's 515 pages. All, each page is just a list of names. But once you start reading through it, and if you search particular code words, a lot of things will pop out at you. Things like ATF Incorporated, and one has to imagine that stands for alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. You've got the attorney generals of the office of the attorney generals of Hawaii and Missouri. Strange. Of course, you've also got Ardent, which I uh, did work on that name before as far as the ADV uh, revolving investment forms go. And Ardent specifically has billions of dollars behind it as a, as a word. You have Azure Summit Technologies, which is well known. Azure is a uh, computer system <coughs> program. You have a lot of universities. There's, uh, interestingly, Arnold Mananix. There's Name Always Shred. American Association of Blood Banks. You've got Amazon. The American Bar Association. The American Maglev Technology of Florida. That's an interesting name there. And here's one that jumped out at me is Apex. And that's just because I've seen a large number of vans driving around here under the guise of plumbing and heating and things like that. But on their van in big letters is the word Apex. And then, of course, you have Arcadia Solar. So naturally, all the solar farms on farmland here, it's all done under Department of Defense contracts. Uh, and then the biggest one above all is... It are, are is the implication of law enforcement, universities, and state lo on local governments, basically. All of them are under the umbrella of DOD contracts. Now, an interesting one that jumps out is this word advanced. Because you have advanced private police, LLC, 
which is a, a pretty big thing it's in itself but you also have advanced sterilization products um, advanced sterilization product services advanced underground inspection and you also have advanced covert technology and advanced mobility and shelter technologies so that's pretty interesting but also acorn yes that's the infamous company that's went down for all sorts of things fraud and whatnot being uh, propped up under the dod contracts now why on earth would acorn have a contract with the dod over twenty-five thousand, or for any amount of money that's a big question there then you got other weird names like accomplices llc is a weird one you also have Aleutian Archaeology, LLC, and ARS Alut Remediation. Now, as far as universities go, you also have something called Associated Universities as its own entity. But if you search university in the document, you'll find you have 285 hits. So pretty much every university that we have and foreign ones, some of some foreign ones, have DOD contracts over twenty-five thousand. Now you also have boards of regions, and I've done quite a great deal of research into the treasonous activities of the University of Nebraska Kearney, and lo and behold, they are a contractor with the Department of Defense. So you have a lot of treasonous institutions that have defense contracts. Very interesting there. Uh, also, there's something called Beacon Services and Interactive Systems. And the reason why this is important is because property listings online, as far as I'm aware, in most cases, are done under a system called Beacon Schneider. You also have some weird names like the Atlantic Council of the United States. And then there's Blood Banks, the Blood Center. There's many pharmaceutical companies that have DOD contracts. And... Some really weird names like Black Bull Military Sociedad Limitada, which of course is not English. You've got B Space E Space E Incorporated, Badger Defense Group, and then you've got something called BBGS SP Space Z Space OO, because it kind of looks like they're trying to do zoo, but they're playing a game with word spaces. Often when you see those names where they're playing games with the name, and putting spaces where it shouldn't be so that you can read it and see what it's supposed to say, but any computer system would miss it because the, like, zoo is not spelled correctly. There's a space between the Z and O. Well, it won't pop up in word system searches. And so a lot of times when they're doing that, obviously it's to hide things. Now, you also have the Council of Chief State School Officers, and I don't know what that is, but it's pretty weird. If you search counties, you'll find 158 hits. So all the count of, well, 158 counties, at least, have contracts with the Department of Defense. But that's not really the biggest thing, because if you search states, you'll get 169 hits. And these aren't just states within a, a, a um, regular sort of LLC business filing name. These are the state of, you know, Washington, the state of Ohio or Virginia or North Carolina, right? These are your state governments with huge DOD contracts. Cities, the same thing. You have 139 hits, and these are, of course, actual cities. The weirdest one is when you search government, which has 135 hits, but also mentions things like the government of Abu Dhabi, the government of the Republic of Korea, the government of Canada. You also have the Virginia State Department of Health, the International Association of Chiefs of Police. And that's a big word there, international. You have the state of Connecticut in that state list. You've got, uh, obviously, a lot of universities, but mainly you have a lot of university systems, like the Colorado State University System, Board of Regents University System of Georgia, Board of Regents South Dakota, Board of Trustees of St. Petersburg College, Board of Water Commissioners of Columbus. Now, obviously, it's not a university, but that's a big one right there. So the best way, and of course, you've, as I mentioned, foreign universities, you've got Bogasici Universitesi, which would not pop up if you did a university search, by the way, because it's not spelled with the Y. You've got a lot of really weird names in companies that would could relate to uh, advanced 
what might be considered extraterrestrial or space technologies. But there's a lot of other creepy things involved in these DOD contracts. One of those are the, or one of those things is with the Departments of Military Affairs, Louisiana, Kentucky, Michigan, and South Dakota. It's a strange name to have DOD contracts. Sounds like something you would find with like the War Departments in the uh, U.S. Civil War. You have the Oregon Department of State Police, Florida Department of State, North Carolina Department of Transportation, Virginia Departments of General Services and Transportation, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Council of Chief State School Officers Incorporated, and if you search Commission, you'll get 20 hits, Council 29 hits, and International gets 530 hits. So under these DoD contracts, the singular name, which gets more hits than anything else, is International. So I think that that puts well into context what exactly the Department of Defense is for, which is international defense, not American national defense, or the defense of the American nation. No, that's not what they're for. They're for the defense of the international globalist nation of phony controllers and tyrants. That's what they're for. A domination, essentially. So it would be more accurate, instead of to call it the Department of Defense, to call it the Department of Domination, because they, essentially speaking, control a lot more than you would expect any kind of military outfit to control. It's pretty clear what is happening there. And, of course, naturally, the, this is the singular umbrella that runs the, or continues to prop up the brainwashing system the oppression of personal finance and the enslavement and uh, in induced poverty of America, if not the globe. So one of the ways that we can read into history, other than, of course, the financial aspect, uh, such as with, with finance, a lot of economic lessons can be found in this book, the... Levantine Adventurer, and I have a, the first American edition. Obviously, there might be revised editions, which I, I would be, at some point, I might compare this to revised editions and see just how much they revised in it. But this first American edition from 1962, printed in 1963. Well, the first American edition was printed in 1963, but the first edition was 1962, which would, of course, be in England. And this book talks about... Uh, the French Levantine trade in the 1600s with the particular perspective of a of the Chevalier or Knight Laurent Darvu whose main mission to the Levant was to establish a commercial or to reestablish the family business through trade in the Levant. He didn't succeed at it but a lot of the reporting is from an economic level, and so it gives you a very good and accurate picture of that sphere of trade at the time, which gives you a way to understand how the international silver standard functioned. Now, another way that you could look through history is through pattern in words, the word structure, how they're used, and similarities. This is uh, part of what Owen Barfield talked about, history and English language, but his books, of course, were heavily revised as well. As with anyone that writes anything useful. The control structure, which did this thing where they put all the, all the big contracts under the Department of Defense to circumnavigate the executive order on focusing on defense contracts, well, they're the same ones that want to sanitize language. And sanitization in this context is removing threat to their control. See, in some cases, they don't actually care that you know that they're doing these fraudulent mechanisms and controlling it. They just don't want you doing anything about it to solve the problem that they're intentionally creating. And that is the idea of sanitization. Sanitization is not to create somebody who's safe for the environment. It's to create somebody who's safe from harming them and their control, specifically or, or damaging the control of their what they believe to be their property. 
So they don't actually care if there's crime or mayhem or chaos or disturbances as long as they're in control of it. So with the language patterns, you can understand the true history by looking at a few things. The first one is with the word gale. Gale generally, equally spelled G-A-L-E, means wind, a type of wind, or the Welsh on the uh, western portion of England or the UK, Great Britain, whichever you want to say. But the Welsh are actually called the Gales. This relates to the word Galatian, Gallic, Gaelic, Gallic, or Gaelic and Gallic. And then you have the Portugales, which is listed as the original word for Portugal in the Itinerario, which was allegedly a book from the 1500s written by a Dutch cartographer working in a service of the Jesuit Portuguese. And he referred to Portugal as Portugales. That would be a phrase rather than a name or a word. It's port, like to carry, port arms in the military, or a port pass, what we call passport. Carried pass is a passport. You are carrying the pass. So port is to carry, and then u gales could be of, perhaps. Um, obviously, we spell of today with an O, but it would have been spelled with a U at some point. And then gales would be G-A-L-E-S. Now you have many other sort of patterns, which we'll go through. We've got tort, which is to twist. You've got extort, which is essentially out of twisting, which is a little bit weird because extort is the word we use for forcing somebody to do something under threat, basically, usually for money. Torture, again, using the word, word there, tort. And then you have ex officio, meaning outside of office. You have juridic, using the jur, which is to swear. And then you have a jure, or juror, which is to swear in French. Then you have a judge and jail. All of these things similarly are in the same context but with the J. Then you have legal, legit, legaty, legacy, and legible, all relating to writing, essentially. You've got gene, genetic, genesis, and generation. And of course, as we know, gene or gen, you have that same with gender and legion or the people in French. Next we've got Rex, Ray, Regent, and this is in a difference to a King, Kaiser, König, or Khan. So in one case you have individuals with a K and the individuals with an R. Ray, of course, is uh, translated to be King, but Regent is not, and yet these words, technically speaking, mean the same thing. A ray and a rex are similar to a regent. Of course, then you can have king regent, which confuses the issue even more. But either way, when you look at the word patterns, you have an understanding about how the origin of these things has been obfuscated. Like a king regent logically would be redundant. Then you have anno, anum, and anonymous. Anno, of course, being year, and anum also being year. You say per annum is what we, how we pronounce it. But then you have liber, libro, libel, liberty, libertas, libertad, Liberia, legere, lair, lur, lair, learn, lael, loyal, lean, and lur. So... Liber is the word for a book, as is libro. And then legere is Italian for to read, as is leer in Spanish. Libel, of course, is generally thought of as written, lying. And we notice, of course, with these patterns here, just like liberty, right? Liberty starts with liber, or book. Libertas is the same thing, and libertad all meaning essentially liberty, but starts with a book. Liberia is, of course, the name of an African country. 
So there's clearly a pattern going on there, which relates to writing. Then you have the AE character, which is spelled in different aspects or pronounced in different aspects in different ways. So you could have a letter that's pronounced differently, but then that's over time changed through the school system of indoctrination, basically. Whereas in the past, most people would have known the different meanings and the different spellings and all that stuff. Nowadays, it gets changed into one <laughs> single standard, which conf then conflicts with old spellings and things like that. So you've got ether, or you could also pronounce it aether as in amon. Amon, A-E-M-O-N, is not pronounced emon. Heathen, and then earth. Earth starts with E-A, and heathen also has E-A, but they're pronounced differently. And then you've got the interesting word Arthur, which appears to be an old word for author. And so you understand how that uh, those words are getting switched around. In most cases, a lot of people will look at that and say, oh, that's not really a big deal. Well, it definitely becomes a big deal when you start talking about so-called government, especially with the word Columbia, which is similar to the word column, Colombia, the country, colonia, colony, and cologne. Christo, uh, Cristobal Cologne is the name for Christopher Columbus in Spanish, and cologne is the first letters for colony. You add a Y to it, and you have colony. Colonia is the Spanish word for colony, which would logically mean that Colombia means colony, and the District of Colombia is the District of Colony. Pretty big deal there, considering we uh, apparently are an ind independent republic and no longer part of the British colonies. That, of course, would not be the case, considering the entire country is ruled over by the quote-unquote District of Colony.